hello. Well, we're attorneys, so you guys each have to pay $500 to attend this session, you know, just to get you started with dealing <laughs> with lawyers. I'm just kidding. Of course. Just, um, I'm going to introduce David and in, in just, well, let me introduce David now. This is David Bondi, who's a colleague of mine, an entertainment lawyer, and you, you want to tell the pertinent facts about you? Sure. I became a lawyer after I was um, in a rock band after college, and we played at CBGB's, and we got signed to a major label, and uh, I was always fascinated by all the things I didn't know about, um, which was everything but the music part. Um, so I ended up getting into this, and I, I represent musicians and artists and writers, um, content producers, I call them, people who create stuff that has value as copyright or trademark. Um, okay. That's it. So um, thank you for coming, and kudos to you for coming. I know contracts isn't probably the most fascinating thing that you can think about, but it's something that you need to know about for your career. You know, and this came home to me on Sunday, I was at the Guggenheim, and I saw the Carrie Mae Weems show, and I looked at the permanent collection, and this is a terrible copy. But I looked at this painting for the first time, I don't think I've ever seen this painting before, and it just was so beautiful, and I was just thinking about how much money his paintings bring now, and how miserable his life was, and how he probably had no representation and no real help. And Carrie Mae Weems is having a major show at the Guggenheim, one of the first black women to have a show there, and she has major representation. I'm sure that she's got contracts that work for her. So I just thought that was a really good introduction to what we're going to be doing today. So uh, congratulations, you have a contract. Somebody wants your work, a gallery, a magazine. Somebody wants to hire you, and they love your work. So they hand you this document, and it's, you know, it's got print this big, and it's full of all kinds of stuff that makes your head hurt. So lots of people I know, um, they just go like this and they say, oh, I'll just sign it. That's what you do. It's got words like work for hire, indemnification, warranties, blah, 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 right? Just sign it, might as well sign it, right? No. I mean, it's great that you have a contract. It's great that you're gonna have this gig, but um, you wanna know what it is that you're signing as painful as it is. So um, here's an example from one of my clients. Um, I'm just going to call them Jack and Jill, but they are a photographer and a writer who created this app called Not The Met. And it's $3.99, which is a lot for an app. It's selling on iTunes. And it's actually a compendium of all the small museums in the city. And it's got directions, descriptions, et cetera, and it could be really, really useful. They work really hard on it. And they made their own deal with Apple, which was really great. So um, then they got a, they decided they wanted to publish it into a book. So they got a, a contract, and it was full of gobbledygook. Now you try reading that, like, you know, uh, it says that, the, that this publisher wants the right to publish it, and just think, you know, translate it into many, many languages. It would be great to sell in bookstores and museums. It would be a great thing for tourists to have, an ebook, whatever. That's just one of the provisions. So they came to me and they said, should I sign this? I really want it published, but I don't want to give all my rights away. So we went over that contract and decided it was that they were just taking too much. Because if it would take you, any of us, even us, I mean, it takes me a long time to read these things because we have to read every word and know what it means and what it says. They basically want the rights to do anything that could possibly ever be done with this material ever. So there are terms in these contracts like any other medi medium, whether now known or hereafter developed. So they, would, they want the rights to any, you know, I mean, there's always a new device every, especially in the last, well, in your lifetime. There's, you know, in a year, there's, there's just so many new devices, you can't even imagine what they'll be. They want the rights to all of those no matter what they are. And those are two or three words you could easily skip over. So you can't do that. So anyway, we looked at the agreement and, we, and they decided, I tell them what it says, and they decided, I'm going to look for somebody else. So they actually found another publisher. They got another contract. We went over it, decided what we could live with, what they would try to negotiate, negotiated enough, and now they have a book. And that shouldn't be, there shouldn't be, um, there shouldn't be text underneath there, but sorry about that. But that's the book. It's out, it's published, it's on Amazon. They've got a book and they're really happy. But the process, the moral of the story is you have to read every word of a contract. 
and you can try to negotiate your rights. Um, and, you, and you might need to get legal help. I would never say get a lawyer for everything because you don't need a lawyer for everything. But if you don't know what the words mean, then you want to get some help. And after, we're going to go over a contract at the end of this. Once you start to understand what contracts say, they're all kind of the same. Whether they're 40 pages or two pages, a lot of the provisions are going to be the same. So it's worth it to kind of learn about it. So here's another example. Um, a client is a jewelry designer. She has a gallery in Chicago. And she called up because she, has, she hasn't heard anything about anything being sold. She wants to get her work back. So she speaks to an assistant who says, you know, let, let me give you to the, you know, the gallery owner. And the owner says, we sold everything. But she hasn't received one cent. So she's a pretty strong individual. And she said, all right, you know, you send me the money. I'm hiring a lawyer. So that was enough for her to get the money back. She then hires a lawyer to get a contract that she could give to the gallery. Because she had nothing in writing. So she couldn't say, if she wanted to sue her for all the money that wasn't paid, she couldn't say, this piece, this piece, this piece is there. You promised me this much money. You sold this. Nothing. So the moral of that story is you want to get it in writing. If you, have, if you have work in a gallery, at the very least, you know, you want to have a list of what they have. How much are they going to pay you? When are they going to pay you? Are they going to pay you like five years after they, after they sell something? 30 days after they sell something? You want to get, get it in writing. So um, we're, going to talk to, we're going to talk about some of the legal, just enough legal ease so you know what a contract is. I mean, you, and then. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to come back to some practical advice, and then we're going to go over what in your handout is a pretty bad contract and see if we can figure out how to make it better. So Dave is going to talk about some of the legal stuff. Patty's going to help me. Okay. Uh, this is a short seminar on, on fire drill? This is a short seminar on contracts plus some questions at the end. You're not going to understand deeply what contracts are and what they do. So don't, don't sweat that too much. I just want you to be introduced to some terms and some concepts. First of all, what is a contract? Oh, there it is. So it's legal, an, a legally enforceable agreement. And what does that mean? It means you can take the agreement to court and the court will recognize and enforce your rights. Okay? If it isn't legally enforceable, the judge will say there's no contract and she will send you home. Um, so what makes a contract legally enforceable? There are three things. Offer, acceptance, and consideration. And what are those? Offer is what it sounds like. Thing one says to thing two, I will draw a logo for you. Don't worry, the rest of it does not rhyme. And what is acceptance? It's also what it sounds like. OK. <laughs> there it is. You have an agreement. The problem is that it isn't a contract yet because there's only a promise going one way. I'm, I have, thing one has to make a logo for thing two. Thing two doesn't have to do anything but sit there and wait for the logo. So there's no contract. So this can be remedied by thing two saying, I'll pay you some money instead. I'll give you some money for this logo. And then you've got the consideration. You've got mutual promises. Both parties have to do something. And you can take that to a court, and a court will enforce it, we hope. Now, um, contracts do not have to be written down. But they should be written down, <laughs> as Carol mentioned. If you don't write it down, a court won't know what it says. And also, you have to argue with each other about what you agreed to orally uh, in the coffee shop, rather than look at the piece of paper where you reduced your agreements to writing. The other advantage of a written agreement is that you, you get to think through the specific issues that matter to you. For example, when am I going to get my logo? When do I have to pay for the logo? Is it after I've received it? Or do I pay a little bit now or a little bit later? What happens if I don't like the logo? Do you have to do additional iterations of it? 
all of those sorts of specifics are the sorts of things that you would talk about if you were getting serious and writing a contract for whatever the job was you were doing or whatever job you were paying to be done. Okay. Um, now, I, I lied to you a little bit before. Um, I said you only needed three things, offer, acceptance, and consideration, the money, the, the mutual promises. That's not quite true. Uh, there's other stuff. Uh, competence is important. Um, each party to a contract has to be uh, 18 years old, at least, um, and needs to be in her right mind at the time she signed. Uh, the first part should be clear, and it may come into play if you want to engage a 14-year-old to write code for you. They seem to know how to do it better than anybody else, so, you know, this, this is a real possibility. Um, as for the right mind part of competence, uh, neither your Auntie Mame with uh, advanced Alzheimer's um, nor your friend Leo, who's just, who's just finished competing in a charity bongathon, uh, is qualified to sign a contract. Um, and no, it doesn't matter where Leo placed in the competition. If somebody's not together, don't have them sign it. Have them sign. Everybody should have clear heads because you don't want an issue later on. Uh, there's also legality. Whatever you're agreeing to, needs to be legal. So an agreement to trash a dorm room or to steal a midterm is not enforceable. You can't go to court with that one. Uh, and also, no slavery, which sounds peculiar, I know. Um, but this is, I mentioned this in the context of, uh, of employment agreements. If somebody wants you to be a graphic designer and they want to employ you and they want you to agree to certain confidentiality provisions and certain other elements, and they want you to sign it, you're not forced to work for that person. You can, you can leave. You can always quit, right? So they can't make you work. That's, that's important. Um, so the next part I'm coming up to is copyright. Do we want to do copyright? Do people know enough about copyright to feel at all comfortable? I'm seeing no. I'm seeing head shaking no. You guys should have taken my class. Ah, well, they'll, well, they'll see the video. <laughs> now, I, I'll, I can go into this some because as, as artists, the value of what, you're, of what you're creating, aside from the object itself, is the copyright that is inherent in your work. That's a lot of weird stuff right there. Um, so what is a painting? Let's take a painting, for example, uh, other than a canvas and some paint. So it's the artist's expression, and it's the rights that arise from that expression. OK? Um, let like me a, be a little more, I'll, I'll try to get a little, a little more grounded about that, because sure. I know that's strange. Um, expressive content is protected not the idea. So for example, if, you, if there's a landscape and a thousand people have painted that landscape, the first person who painted it doesn't have a claim to the landscape. They have a claim to the rights in their expression of the landscape. I know it's abstract. Like it doesn't get a lot cleaner than that, but, but the point is you, even if you create a work for someone, and you've painted it, you as the creator own the rights automatically, even if they pay you for it. It's crazy, right? But that's good. That's good for you. There needs to be an express agreement to assign the rights to somebody else, right? So as a creator, this is good news. You just automatically get this good stuff. But then what is this good stuff? There's a whole list of them in the copyright law. These are the specific things that you guys get. You get the right to reproduce your work, making copies or phono records, which is if you wrote a song, right? You get the right to prepare derivative works. So if you want to sketch your work or you want to take a photograph of your work, you're the only one who has the right to do it, even if you sold the painting to somebody else. Merely selling it does not give them these rights. Even if they 
paid you to paint it for them, it doesn't give them these rights. Until you've assigned those rights or licensed those rights, certain rights, to them to do this stuff. Otherwise, it's yours. Um, we can talk briefly about transfers, so, uh, very briefly, or do you want to do, please? So, to have co copyright is called, it's called intellectual property. It protects what you create. And you all create stuff, way more than we create stuff. I mean, we create pieces of paper, but they're not very original. All you have to do is have something original, which you all have, in tangible form. And you can have a copyright. As long as it is, it's not a recipe, it's not a procedure. It's a painting, it's a drawing, it's a photograph, it's a graphic design, it's a sculpture. The, as soon as you create it, and as soon as it's tangible, you own it. So like, here's an idea that if you don't like a contract, you can stick your tongue out and somebody can take a picture. So that's an idea. So let's say I decide to take a picture of him sticking his tongue out at a contract. That's fine, you know, it's just an idea. But if I copy this exact photograph, this exact photograph, whoever took this has a copyright in this particular image. So whatever you create, in tangible form you own the copyright to. And what David is saying is, as soon as you do that, uh, this isn't the most creative thing in the world, but... Well, but that photograph okay. has specific elements in it that are owned by the person who took that picture. Yeah, so the, the photographer has exclusive rights. Only the photographer can copy this, distribute it, display it, um, adapt it, and the fifth one doesn't really apply to this. But there are exceptions, of course, but there are exclusive rights that you have when you create this work. And you know, in a whole other seminar, we could talk about when you can use other people's work, because that's what a lot of people want to know. But you're asking, but you have copyright as soon as you create your work, and you each could probably think whatever you create, you have copyright as soon as you do it. And that's a whole. I'm not saying you should take my class, but you really should learn about copyright because you have all these rights that are really important for you to know about, to be able to enforce. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's worth a lot of money to you, and it's really important that you know, because you already have it. But if you don't know you have it, people will try to take it from you. And that's like, it's, we could talk for hours about it, but it's important that you learn more, and David tried to well, do this, it in two yeah. minutes. But. I mean, this comes up here because the contracts that you're going to be entering into most likely relate to your creative output. Somebody wants you to take a picture for them or they want you to do their, you know, whatever it is. And that's all stuff that you would own, and that's what this next piece is about transfers of rights. Very quickly, I don't want to, I mean, do we have time to quickly talk about um, work for hire, assignment, and license? Well, yeah. I mean, okay, all right, quickly. I won't read it, we'll go quick. Um, Work for hire, well I will read this because it tricks, trips me up. It's a concept in copyright law whereby the person who commissioned a work, that is paying to have it made, is deemed to be its owner, bypassing its creator entirely. So if you, there are two ways this can happen. If you're employed by someone and you, they give you an office and they have, you have a computer and you're doing work and they've, they're employing you to create a certain kind of work, whatever kind of work it is, even if it's writing novels, they will own it without any piece of paper because you're creating it within the scope of your work. They employed you to do it and, they're, and you're doing that work. They own it. If you're at a company and you're writing emails on the company stuff, on the company computer system, they own those emails. It's the same principle, right? A lot of what you'll create won't be as employees. It will be as work for hire, as on commission. Somebody says, I commission you to take my portrait, for example, paint my portrait. So that person's going to pay you money. And if they want to own all the rights in that portrait, they would try to get it as a work for hire somehow. And there are specific rules about that, and that's when you call your lawyer. It's very hard to do it, and in fact, I would say you can't have a painting as a work for hire. No, I wouldn't go into all that. Wouldn't... It's almost true. Yeah. <laughs> almost. There are exceptions, occasional exceptions, if it's part of an audiovisual work. There are a few exceptions, but generally, 
a painting or a novel, if you're not employed by the person, but they're just paying you to do it and you work at home and you're not an employee, in that case, you would assign rights to them or license rights to them. Or just give them the, the picture and you retain all the rights. A lot of people who commission you may not know what they want other than a portrait on their wall, in which case that's all they get. So like all these rights that we said you have, all these exclusive rights, if it's work for hire, you don't have them. It's like you, at the end of a film it says work for hire, it always says the studio. All these rights we're telling you you have, if the, the contract says work for hire or if it, you're employed, you don't have any of those rights. So it's something that you want to watch out for. You don't want to yeah. sign them away unless you really have to or it's a good idea for you to do it. Yeah. It just means it's enough to know no copyright. Work for hire means the opposite of copyright. Forget for, it. For the creator. The crea right. The yeah. creator doesn't own these anymore. If you sign, if you sign your rights, if, if you work for me, I own all the rights in these and I can do all this stuff with it that we told you you can do. So it's something to take really seriously. Yeah, that's for sure. Assignment uh, is when you, uh, you own rights, whether you've obtained them somehow or you were the creator of something, the author, as they say in copyright law, um, and you want somebody else to have those rights. So if you've written a book and you want to assign those, uh, the publishing rights to a publisher so that they will publish the paperback and hardcover, you can assign the English language rights, um, translation rights, um, uh, the territory can be worldwide, it can be U.S. only. It's, you assign whatever rights um, to, those, to whoever it is you want to assign them, hopefully for money, royalty, whatever it is. And assign means you're giving it, it's like a contract, you're contracting it away, you know? Do you, does that, like if you, you have a, how many of you have leases? You probably have a lease. You have some, some piece of paper that says you can live in your apartment. You can, if you assign that lease to him, you're giving him the right to, you're giving him the rights that you have. So that's what assign means. Right. Is that a word that you know? I think that, we use these terms all the time and we yeah. forget that. Well, it's like you're selling. It's as close as you can get in this context to selling something. It's not an object you're selling. You're selling the right to all those things that, that were posted before. The right to distribute copies of it, to, to make derivative works as, as in a photograph of a painting is the derivative work of the painting. Strange, right? It shows the image of the painting, but it isn't the painting itself. It's a derivative work. You, you can assign any of those rights, any or all of those rights, to somebody else to exploit them, hopefully, to make money so that they pay you. That's, that's, one of the, that's how you do it. Well, if you make a film and you have somebody distribute the film, you're giving, you're assign, you're, you're giving a contract to somebody. You know, you're, right. you're splitting up all the stuff you have. Right. Well, there's another way to do this, which is licensing which is similar to assignment, but you're not actually selling the thing to them or the rights to them. You're, you're leasing it to them. You're letting them use it for a certain period and for certain purposes within certain territory, U.S. only, for a certain time period. Um, there are also non-exclusive licenses where somebody doesn't have the only right to use something. Say, for example, you paint a portrait of someone and she hangs it on her wall. And then her girlfriend loves that portrait and wants to use it in her movie. You can give the girlfriend a license to use that, that portrait in her movie, but it's a non-exclusive license because you can use it in other movies, you can put it into art books, you can do whatever you want with that image. So that would just be a particular right that doesn't stop you from doing anything else. That would be a non-exclusive right to use. Oh, it's, con it's complicated, I know. There'll be a lot of question, long question you period at the end. Question. There will be. So that, that takes us through, um, quickly, licensing. You want to move on? Uh, yeah, no, you probably what, should. What, what are you, <laughs> oh, I just had more, more specifics about licensing. Next thing I, was, I would talk about is um, uh, why, uh, uh, why you would consult with a lawyer. When, when to do it and why you would do it. 
Okay, this is a lot less technical, fortunately. Um, why do you consult with a lawyer to help you through all of this? Right? There are lawyers who specialize in this stuff, who, who, who live in this and, and get it. Um, so let's say that um, someone approaches you and they want, you know how to make a legally binding agreement now. You know what has to be in it. You know that if the person's out of their mind, you can't make an agreement with them. You know that if, if you have to give them something but they don't have to give you anything, that's not legally binding. That's not a real contract. So you know how to do that stuff. But what else do you know? What are the options? What are the parameters of an agreement? What would you expect should be in an agreement? This is what lawyers are supposed to know and help you with because we've seen a ton of these things. And we know what works and what doesn't work. And we can save you a lot of time. And we can protect your copyright and only grant to people the rights that they really need and retain all the rest for you so that you can use them in some other context. Okay, we, we can do all that kind of stuff. Um, but I spend most of my time, I find, teaching my clients, explaining to them what their rights are in a particular situation. No lawyer is any good is going to tell you what to do. I've never met one who's any good who tells you what to do. You have to make the decision because it's your career and it's your life. And these concepts, if you, in, in the real world, when you have a real situation in front of you, you know what you want to do with it. If somebody wants to hire you to, write a, to, to, to paint a portrait of them, you're happy to do it. You want a certain amount of money. You want to make sure you're going to get paid something up front so you can buy the paints. You may have very specific ideas about what you want. Most of these, you would know. It's common sense. The stuff you don't know, we can help explain to you. Okay. Um, And the last thing I wanted to talk about was the limits of a contract. People feel like if you have a contract, you're safe somehow. Um, that's a little too strong. <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. Without a contract, you're sunk. <laughs> so that's even worse. But with a contract, and if it's written and it's good, you're in the best position you can be in. Now, the contract itself isn't going to wash your dishes or, or shovel your front walk. It doesn't do anything um, except explain the terms of whatever the deal was that you struck. So if the person who hired you isn't paying you, you can confront them and hope that they will be good, a good guy about it and pay you. But if they don't pay you, you have to go to court because, I mean, otherwise you can roll the contract up and hit them over the head with it. It just isn't any good. So you need to be in a, the best position so that if somebody rips you off or they use your work in a way that you expressly said they couldn't, uh, you, can go, you can take them to court or at least threaten to take them to court. And sometimes that's all it takes, as Carol mentioned before. Um, that's what I got for now. Okay. So, well, we'll, I'm going to give you some... A lot in there. Yeah. I apologize. It's like getting hit by a yeah, bus. Yeah, I know. So now I'm going to give you just some practical, practical advice. Um, now, let's see. Yes. <laughs> how many of you, how many of you actually have signed agreements? And what areas of, uh, what kinds of artists are you? How many are photographers? How many of you are fine artists? Okay. Uh, filmmakers, graphic designers, illustrators, cartoonists, okay, what else? What did I not mention? Sculptors, whatever else. Everything that we say applies to everybody. Everything we say about contract applies to everybody. Everything I say about a photographer applies to all of you. What David says about a writer, it applies to all of you. So, um, let's see, sorry. It's okay. Just some practical advice. Get it in writing 
Now, you don't have to have every single thing in writing. If you agree to go, you know, out on a date Saturday night, you don't have to get that in writing or, you know, you're going to go out somewhere with a friend. You have a good, you guys have instincts better than most people, so you'll know when you need it and when you don't, hopefully. But if there's ever a doubt, just think about the fact, like, what happens if something goes wrong? And our job is to think of, is to be negative. You know, what happens if there's a problem? <laughs> And as David said, you, you kind of hope you never ever have to look at this contract because then you have a problem. But what happens if something goes wrong? Like, so I had my students a couple days ago do collaboration agreements. And you know, I hadn't thought about it before. But somebody said, well, what happens if we don't agree on how to make this film? That's the kind of thing you might want to put in an agreement. Or what happens if somebody just disappears for six months? You know, that's something you might want to put in an agreement. It's really a lot of common sense what you need um, so, but I say you get it in writing, and the best example is if you have work in a gallery, and, and uh, the, the dealer sells five pieces and gets $50 million, you get nothing, and you walk in and say, I want my money, and there's a new owner or the, the uh, own, dealer's out of town in Florida, in Hawaii, how do you prove that you had five pieces there? You know, all you have to have is a piece of paper when you put the work there that says these are the five these are the five works that are going to be in the gallery. You're going to get 50% commission, and you're going to get paid 30 days after the dealer gets paid. It can just be, it can be simple, but get it in writing. Um, know the other party. A contract with a, like David said, with somebody who's insane or somebody who has no authority means nothing. If I say to you, how would you like to show the Gagosian gallery? You know, wouldn't it be, how would you like to do that? And you say, sure. And I give you a contract that says, you get 90% of the sales and I pay you before the work is sold. That's cool, and you might like that contract, but I have nothing to do with Gagosian Gallery, so that means nothing. So the, the, con the person that you contract with, first of all, they have to have authority to do that with you, and you want to know that they're okay, because you're, you know, you're trusting them. So like there's this dealer, Kathy Markell, who has a gallery in Chelsea, and she has a gallery in Bridgehampton, and she'll say, um, you know, she let me actually take a painting home once just to try it out. She didn't have me sign anything. And I don't think she has contracts with her artists, but I know that she pays them. So if you, have, if you, if you show with her, it's probably okay, because she really thinks artists should just stomp into their gallery or whoever owes them money and say, you owe me money. Um, but if you have a contract with other people, it may not work at all. I mean, there are people that have gone bankrupt. Uh, what's the name of the guy who had who had a gallery on, on the Upper East Side, who is in jail now because he took people's money. He sold paintings. He like, sold like five halves of a painting to, to five people, and you could only have two halves of a painting. I can't remember his name, but I'll think of it. I made a movie called The Producers about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, a great contract with all the legal terms in it means nothing if the person you're dealing with is nuts or is going to swindle you or doesn't even right. exist. There's, a, there's an old expression lie down with dogs, get up with fleas. It works really well in this context. If you're, if you're dealing with a bad actor and you think you're going to contract around his badness to the extent that you're going to be safe now because your contract covers everything, you can have a thousand page contract and people like that are going to find a way to screw you. They're just going to because that's who they are. So if you know that, part of Part of creating a contract with somebody is learning about them, doing your due diligence, understanding who this is that you're dealing with. If it's a major gallery, you know who you're dealing with, at least with, with respect well, to the can. public relations part of it. You know they can benefit you, although they may screw you too. Mm -hmm. um, but lie down with dogs, get up with fleas. It, it's really good. It's good to remember that. Sorry. No, Carry no, on. No, okay. So, um, <laughs> You know, enforce your right to get paid. You know, a lot of times, everybody's personality is different, but I have a client who's a photographer, and she's also a journalist, and she, she knows that she wasn't getting paid because the gallery said, I've sold a, paint, a photograph, and she makes a print. And she knew she wasn't getting paid, and she was pissed off. So she came to me, and I told her, there's a provision in the law that protects you against galleries, which is a whole other thing we could talk about. I gave her the legal stuff she needed to know. She actually wrote a letter. And she's still showing with that dealer, and she's getting paid. Because sometimes people won't pay you unless you sort of push them. So, you know, enforce your right to get paid. The contract is not standard. People who hand you contracts, 
and then there's one in here, which we're going to look at in a little bit, we'll say. This is standard. They always say that. And it's standard for them. It's written by their lawyers to benefit them. And there are all kinds of them. Some of them are, are horrible. Some of them are fair. But standard does not mean it's standard for you. It means it's their way of saying, oh, just sign this. But most likely, it benefits them and not you. And most hopefully, they'll negotiate it. But do not fall for that. It's standard, and so you should sign it. I mean, there are, like, lawyers can tell you, people in the industry, you know, like, what's, what's standard, what's kind of the terms that people use. Like if you make a feature film, you know that you have to give your rights to this in the screenplay to the people that make the film, or you sort of know how much money people make. But they, when them, when if somebody hands you a contract as a standard, that doesn't mean that it is. And if they say to you, "We need this right away," unless it's like National Geographic or the you know the New York Times is coming out tomorrow, and somebody won the, the skiing Olympics competition today, if they really don't need it tomorrow. You take some time to look at it. Um, you know, you could say, I got to show it to my lawyer, even if you don't have one. If, or you can just say, I need time to look at it. But look at it, because every word is going to make a difference. All these boring words that we throw out and that are in here can make a big difference. And some people put more words in to confuse you than others. You know, a really nice, clear contract would be really great. A lot of them are not. You know, the music industry is notorious, well, you know it really well, for being really confusing, big, thick contracts that, I mean, nobody knows what they mean, really. So um, you got to know what every word means. Because if, for example, as David explained, work for hire, if you do a, you know, a photo shoot and you're not an employee of somebody, you do a photo shoot, somebody asks you to do it, but the contract says it's work for hire, that means they own all the rights, and you can't use those photographs again. You can't do anything like that, because you'll be infringing their copyright. So three words can make all the difference in the world. And the problem with those words, it sounds like, well, I hire you, therefore, isn't that work for hire? But le work for hire legally means no copyright. I can hire you to do something. Let's say I hire you to paint my portrait. No, I'd be terrible. Well, and you paint it. You own the rights in that, even though it's of me. But, and it's not work for hire, but if my contract says work for hire, um, then I own all the rights, which, and that's not such a big deal for my portrait, but for you, it's a big deal and you don't want to give all your rights away unless you have to. Some industries you have to, and it may be worth it to you to work for Disney and do a work for hire agreement, but at least know that that's what it says. That's what it means. So you have to know what the words mean, and if you don't know, and I can't imagine that you would know all the words, you got to find out. So you either ask a lawyer, or there are, ad there are lots of organizations um, that will help you. ASMP is a good one for photographers. And they actually have, are there, I've got a, um, a resources page here, and they're on there. It's got, they've got contracts, tutorials. They've got all kinds of explanations about what they are. They can tell you what the provisions should be. So if you have an organization like that, it's really useful. The Graphic Artist Guild is really good at that. And they may even review your contract and not charge you. But, um, and if you have to hire a lawyer, the more you know, the better. Because it can take, if we really went over this agreement, it could take a few hours. And you have to pay lawyers by the hour. And the more you know, the, l the less you need a lawyer. So the more you kind of learn these terms, the better you are. Um, so what else? As I say, you've got to read and understand, you've got to understand every word. So like those terms, in all media now known and hereafter devised. If you made a film in 1990 and you signed that, then the producer has the rights to make DVDs and God knows whatever things there are. Netflix, every single, but every single entity that can, that can distribute that film, they have the rights. You don't have any more rights. You can't make any more money from that film. So um, you may not want that to happen. And why does somebody need all those rights? You know, that's just another, just common sense. The publisher who did the ebook, not the Met, did they need to make um, records of it and braille copies? Well, maybe braille copies, but what do they really need? You know, if they need something and they'll pay you for it, fine, but that's a kind of common sense thing. Do they need every single thing? Um, the word indemnify, how many of you know what that means? No, it's a legal word you're going to see in almost every contract. It means pay. 
So in these, we're going to see it in this one. There's a provision that says you have to indemnify them if there are any claims, any legal claims at all. You indemnify the publisher, say. That means you pay for those. Does that make sense? Is that fair? You want to pay legal fees of the publisher? Um, no. It might make sense in certain cases. Maybe. Right. If, yeah, we're going to get to that warranty. It would, but right. you've got to know what that word means so you can at least negotiate it. You can just say, I don't have a team of lawyers. I don't have lots of money. How can I pay your legal fees? Or maybe you only pay the legal fees if you really do something wrong. Like if you just literally copy her work and you, you know, sell it to him and he makes a film and, you know, he gets sued by her because of you, well, maybe that makes sense because you did something wrong. But if you just do your work and I come along and say, oh, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to say it's mine. You have to pay those legal fees. Is that fair? That's not fair. But that's what a lot of them say. So there are words you need to know. Find out if they'll negotiate. A lot of, it, there's all kinds of people you're in contract with. Really great people who are on the up and up and not so great people. Before you hire somebody, find out if they'll negotiate. I mean, I've, I've had people come to me and I go over the contract with them and then I call the other lawyer and they say, sorry, it's take it or leave it. So you want to find that out before you hire somebody. And you can find out from your peers. You can find that out. Uh, what else is it? Well, get help if you need it. So there's the volunteer lawyers for the arts who can help you if you don't make too much money. If you make a lot of money, find yourself a lawyer you like. And use the lawyer when you need it. Maybe you won't need it because you'll keep learning stuff. You keep coming to these things. You know, there are all kinds of seminars like this around um, uh, where you can get, get help to try to understand it. And maybe you can help each other. Uh, wrong direction. Well, this is a list of resources. Um, so copyright's a huge subject that you really need to know about because it's all the rights and all the stuff you create. And the Copyright Office, the government runs the Copyright Office, has great um, pamphlets and explanations in plain English for you. So that's a great website to know. Um, there's one on Work for Hire. There's a pamphlet on copyright. You can register your copyright, which is a whole other subject, but you really should do because you can't really, it, it allows you to sue and get money. Um, here's a, the second one's a really good one, um, that, but it's not edu, it's .org, keepyourcopyrights.org. That Columbia has this website where they, Columbia University Law School, where they show you bad provisions and contracts and good ones and they tell you about keeping your copyright so you don't sign it away. So there's a lot of stuff you can go to there. You're not going to sit and read it, you know, all weekend long, but when you need it, you go to these things like we don't sit and read this stuff unless we have to, right? <laughs> but if we have to, we know where to go, where to look things up. So that's what you want. Like give yourself, get yourself a folder and throw this stuff in it or create a folder on your computer where you can put this stuff because when you need it, you can go to it. It'll save you lots of money and it'll, Things are going to come up and then you'll have a question and you'll, you'll have heard a little bit so you can go more. ASMP is a really good one and it's about copyright so even though it's very much for photographers, it, copyright applies to everybody the same way. doesn't matter. So I'm talking about copyright of a photograph, the same copyright law applies to painting or sculpture or illustration. It's, and it's got tutorials on contracts and it's also got how to register your copyright. Graphic Artist Guild has a really good website. They, it may not be in book form anymore. They used to have a book of contracts for every single kind of commercial artist you can imagine, standard contracts. And they will even say, give them your own contract. Use this one. If they say, here's the contract, you say, no, this is the one I want to use. And obviously, you've, you determine when you can do that and when you can't. I mean, you can't just say no to everybody and you may decide it's not worth it or you need the money. We can't tell you that, but at least you have knowledge. And then there's Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, which is an organization that exists to help artists. And they've got seminars, they've got um, brochures, they've got books. They, they always have an ongoing series of this kind of thing, contracts, copyright, how to start a business. So you can keep learning about stuff. OK, so let me just tell you what the rest of this handout is. Um, these two articles, this contract sucks, part one and two, ASMP has a bulletin. And they always have a column about legal stuff for photographers, and it's in plain English. So this one is about, about what we're talking to you about. Like, you know, you can take it home when you can read it, but it's basically saying, 
that there are a lot of really bad contracts out, out there. And as soon as, especially when the internet got big, everybody wants the rights. You know, the companies want all your rights. They don't need all your rights. How do you deal with it practically? So this talks about that and a little bit about why. And then the second one basically gives you two, it's two practical things to think about. Are you willing to walk away from the contract? You know, if you, if you can't walk away, you need the job, you want the job, you're not in as good position. And you know, you have to kind of determine what, what you're gonna settle for and what you're not. And maybe you're gonna just sign it because you have to. But uh, you know, SVA sends me a contract, I sign it. You know, I don't really negotiate with them. I mean, even you guys wanted to release to, to film this. We're lawyers, you know, so I say, no, only this, only if I can review it and blah, blah, blah. And they say, sorry, you know, you can't. So I can say, no, you can't. But that would have been sort of obnoxious, right? So there are times that, or, you know, if somebody comes along that you want to work for, you may, you, you know, you may. But um, anyway, that's one question to ask. And the second question is, like, are you, do you know the person you're dealing with willing enough to give them credit? And like I say, know who you're, we both say know who you're dealing with. You're really giving credit to somebody else because you're doing work without getting paid. They, they're going to owe you money. So you, you know the other person. Anyway, these are really good practical uh, things. We're going to talk about this second contract and why it's not good. And then this, I know this last bit of stuff is dated 1994, like before you were born probably. But 1994, the, all of a sudden the internet's big and people want to steal rights. Companies want writers and everybody to sign, um, oh, to the, to the resources, thank you. Everybody wants you to sign all rights agreements. I wrote a column for Backstage called Arts and the Law, and all of a sudden, I'm telling people how to keep their rights and this and that, all of a sudden, they want me to sign an agreement that I don't have any rights in my column and they have all the rights. And I didn't care that much, I just refused to do it because I was telling people not to sign those kinds of things. Um, so Matt Mahuron, I don't know if he's photographing anymore, he used to do covers for Time Magazine and he would, he would, he would um, make himself up to look like whoever, it's kind of like Cindy Sherman, he would make himself up to look like whoever the cover, the cover article was about. So if the article was about Freud, he would create himself to look like Freud, photograph himself and that was the cover of Time Magazine. And he was in demand, he was a, you know, so he would come and talk to artists and he, show, he talked about the Condé Nast agreements. And he, he said there are levels of agreements. Condé Nast has different kinds of agreements for different photographers. So maybe when you first start out, you get this agreement. When you're more you know, well-known, you get this agreement. So you want to kind of find that out from the other people that deal with them. And then there's also an agreement that he got that said, you know, re we have the right to crop, retouch, or other otherwise modify the work. If he didn't read this and just signed it, but he didn't like that, that they could change his work without asking him. So he wrote a letter, and it's in here, and you can look at it when you have time or want to, basically saying, I, it's insulting that you would ask me, that you would have the right to just change my work without even talking to me about it. You know, usually the fair thing would be if you want to change it, show it to me and let's discuss it. Let's both okay it. Because that's really not cool. And he refused to work for them unless they, um, unless they took this out. He's not, do he's not photographing anymore. But it's just an example of the kind of thing that you want to think about. So take a look at this agreement. This is, a, an agree this is an illustration assignment agreement that Scholastic would give to its illustrators. And see if you can figure out what's wrong with it. Um, how, much we, how much time do we have? We don't have a whole. Let's see. I'm just going to point out, well, let's see here. If you look at the second, the first real paragraph, the um, artist agrees to illustrate work in form and content, content satisfactory to the publisher. And then they have to do it by a certain date, time being of the essence. Do you think there are any issues with that? What would, just what would come to your mind when you see satisfactory to the publisher? It's very vague. So when is it going to be satisfy, satisfactory to the publisher? You know, if they just don't like it, then sorry, they're not going to pay you. You want some kind of something objective to know when it's satisfactory to the publisher, because you know they could just make you do work forever and ever, ever. Maybe 
one or t X number of hours you will do it. Maybe you'll, you'll revise it for a certain amount of money according to at least objectively co objective commercial standards. But th those kinds of words will, you know, if, if it makes your stomach churn, it, it, there's a reason for it. Time of the essence is a legal term that means if you're one minute late, you're screwed. So why does it have to be time of the essence? I mean, if it really has to be, fine. But if it doesn't have to be, what happens if you know there's a hurricane or a snowstorm, or you can't actually get there? You can't get it there because, you know, we've had a major blizzard. If if this is, why does this have to be there? Then rights. This third paragraph, the third real paragraph, is all about rights. And just put a star there because it basically. You know, when you learn about copyright, if you give it away, you give away your ability to enter. You have a work which you could exploit. You could sell, you can license, you can do all kinds of stuff with it because you have the copyright. But if you look at grants, transfers, assigns, all rights, title, interest, in and to the illustrations, worldwide and in perpetuity. So worldwide, forever and ever and ever, they're getting all your rights. And they might as well have said work for hire, but they didn't say work for hire because people know not to sign work for hire. They are entitled, but they're not required to publish. So they're going to have your work, but they don't have to do anything with it. Is that fair? No, that's not fair. And then they can distribute it if they want to. They can change it if they want to in all forms of media now known or hereafter developed. This whole paragraph, you really would want to try to negotiate. OK, what is it that you need? What is it you want from me? How much are you willing to pay me? How are we going to deal with it if you don't like it? You really, if they need it forever and ever and for the whole world, just think, it's, just think they could have copies of what magazine? I don't know. What, what magazine do people read these days? Are there magazines these days? I don't know. <laughs> well, let's just so it's on um, worldwide. Everything is worldwide. But let's say it's translated into 50 different languages. There should be money for each of those translations. Or different, you know, if it's Europe, Asia, there, there are all the different markets where you can, you can license stuff. So at least you want to think about what you can do with the rights that you have. And you don't want to sign this unless you really have to. It may not be worth it to you to sign this. It might be worth it to you to work for Scholastic. But just know you can say goodbye to that work unless they decide to give it back to you because they have gotten all these rights. And when we talk about copyright, you have exclusive rights. You can decide who gets to copy your work and who gets to adapt your work and who gets to show your work. You decide. But if you give them all the rights forever and ever, forever, you lost that. So it may not be worth it for you. I and mean, my nephew's a photographer and he's just starting out. So he'll sign Getty's contract that gives him Bubka's money just to, just to get his name out there, but he doesn't give him the really good one. He'll give him maybe five just to, just to get his name out there. People can see his work and then you know, he can hopefully do something better. So this kind of paragraph, you're always going to see a, pub a paragraph on rights. So it's the kind of thing you really want to understand, and we didn't even touch on it. And if you're interested and you'd like us to do one on copyright, we will. Or, you know, sign up for a class somewhere. It's a, it's a, I think it's the most important thing that you can really learn about, because it's what you have. This is all these assets that you have. I call my class Protect Your Creative Assets because that's what you have. I can't do what you can do. I don't know if you can. Maybe you can. I can't do it or I would be doing it because, you know, it's probably more interesting than this. No, this is fine. But you've got all this talent. <laughs> and, you know, it's worth a lot of money to people. That's why they want it. So they just kind of hope that maybe you aren't so business savvy, but you're going to get business savvy. But really look at the rights paragraph because, I mean, I had a client who came to me who wanted to do a, a musical of this movie that he loved. And he actually wrote the whole thing out. Well, this was a movie that he loved. What's the problem with that? He did not have the rights to that movie. And if he, if he wanted them, he had to pay a whole lot of money to get them. If you want to do an act, like somebody made the, uh, did a musical called Once on Broadway. It's based on a film. And they got the rights to the film, but you can't just go make a, something out of something else. You're, n you're not going to get it made. You've got to know about rights. So that's the most important paragraph of all. So um, what about the very last paragraph on this page? Is there anything that's problematic that you see in that paragraph? What? They don't credit you. I mean, what does it cost them to give you credit? Maybe that's why you're doing it, so your name is there. So you, you can discuss that. Like, you know, you, 
give me credit. What's, what's the harm? Not nice. Uh, now, what about the first paragraph on the second page? Artist agrees for two years from the date of this agreement. Artists shall not, without the written consent of a publisher, of publisher, publisher authorized to be published any material based on material in the illustrations of a nature such that it would likely compete with the illustrations. That seems a little overreaching, doesn't it? Plus, they haven't, they haven't promised to use it, and they haven't promised to pay you, but you cannot use them for two years or anything like it. You just say, that just seems unreasonable seems unreasonable. So if, there's, if they're, not gonna, if they're gonna use it, it's, it's reasonable for there to be a time period when you don't do certain other things with it, depending. But that's not very reasonable. So, um, and now the next one, every single contract you see is gonna have warranties and indemnifications. Those are legal words. But they, what it means is the warranty is, a war will you warrant, you swear, you promise. Basically, they're asking you to say your work's original. That's reasonable because you could copy it from somebody else and they don't want to deal with a, a lawsuit. So basically, you're saying, but you're also saying you don't, you don't infringe anybody else's, do you know what these, all these things are? Copyright, trademark, right to privacy or publicity, property, common law, statutory right, or what else? I guess that's all. You, you have to swear that you haven't violated any of those rights. Do you know what that means? If you took my class, you know. No, I'm just kidding. But you want to know what those things mean because you're saying you haven't done that. But that's reasonable for them to, to ask because they don't want to get sued because you, you know, copied Steven Spielberg's screenplay and you're, you know, you're acting like it's yours and he hasn't bothered to show it to anybody. That's a reasonable thing. Then they say indemnify means pay. Anybody makes a claim that relates to your work, this says, you indemnify the publisher. You pay any costs related to any claims about the work. Now that isn't really fair, because let's just stay out of the blue. People come out of the blue all the time and say, that's mine, that's mine, that's mine. Some of them are, are believable and some of them are not. That's not really fair. So, but it is fair if you, if you, did, if you did copy somebody else's work that you'd have to pay. So what, what could you do to make that a little bit more reasonable? You know, you just can say, that's just crazy. I don't have, you know, I can't pay those kinds of legal fees. I don't have a, you know, a team of lawyers. Um, if I do something wrong and a court says I do something wrong, then I should have to pay. That's what I try to get people to say that, you know, if, if a court actually says, in their legal words you could use, you don't have to know them, but if a court actually says you did steal somebody else's work, okay then. But otherwise it's just not fair for you to have to take that on. It's just not, you try to get that knocked out. Some people can, some people can't, but you're going to see that. You want to know what it means, because you could get a letter from this company saying, we got a claim, this is the, this is the bill for the lawyers. And th you know, they're not going to ask you which lawyer to go to, and lawyers charge everything from 200 an hour to 2,000. How much, what's the highest you've ever seen? <clears throat> 1,200. Yeah, I mean, $1,200 an hour, some lawyers charge. I sure don't. I don't think you do either. No. So, you know, that's kind of a it's thing nice that, though. you know, your eyes could glaze over when you look at this, but, you know, that's crazy. So, um, let's see, what else might be wrong with this? One, two, three, four, five. What else? The paragraph, the fifth paragraph down, what's wrong with that? If the artist fails to meet his obligations under this agreement or does not meet the criteria or the specica specifications or the industry standards in publisher's discretion, then publisher shall be entitled either to terminate the agreement on notice to the artist or if schedule permits to off offer artists first opportunity to re-illustrate in accordance with the specs at no additional fee to publisher. No. I mean, you would like to <laughs> get prove that, you know in the publisher's discretion, so completely at the publisher's whim if they decide that they don't like it or they don't want to use it. It's got to be, it can't be that, it can't be that one-sided. Um, I, I don't know why they would write such a thing. I mean, if, they, if, if it's a publisher and you're doing work for their magazine and they don't like your work, they won't ask you to do any more work. It's very simple. It's a business solution. 
Writing something like this is a thumb in the eye. You don't even have, you don't, it doesn't have to be there. That's dumb from their side of it. It makes it look like an awful agreement when they would have done this anyway. That's how it goes. They don't like your work, you don't work. Very simple. And it's fair. Why should they have to use work they don't like? Very simple. So they pay you. If it doesn't work out, yeah, they move to should, the next one. But why should they have to not pay you for work that you do, that they ask you to do? Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's, I'm not saying this is good. I'm saying this, this could be structured in a lot of ways. But this is, this is what we call a contract of adhesion, which is similar to an insurance contract. If you get automobile insurance, you don't negotiate the terms. You get insurance. You sign it. You get it. That's how it goes. This, why would they negotiate with you? If there's, if there's a, an illustrator with some, with some story to tell, you got a name or you've been published and you've had a book published or you've, had, you know, you've shown up in other publications, they wouldn't give you this contract because you'd look at this and say no. And they want you, so they're not going to ask this of you. But if you're no one graduating from school, like some of you will, maybe all of you, and you're confronted with something like this, you may well agree to something like this. But think about it first. It yeah. isn't a good deal, but yeah, it I may mean, be the thing that you want because you'll be published in this magazine, maybe, Yeah, but if they like of, your stuff. A lot of people, you know, you, keep, you read about, in the New York Times or wherever, you read about SVA. This person went to SVA. This person went to SVA. It's not like... I mean, you know, I don't know what you're saying, like you just graduated, maybe you don't have a reputation yet, some of you do, some of you don't, but it's like you got this talent and you graduated from SVA too. You don't, right. maybe you don't have bargaining power yet, maybe some of you do, but so the Graphic Artists Guild, which is why it's important to find an organization, has been arguing with them about improving this contract. So, I mean, maybe you're not going to take them on. You've got your work to do and this and that. Maybe you're just going to sign it. Maybe. Or maybe you're not. But they've been talking to them about why it's not fair, and they're, they're coming up with better versions. But sometimes, you know, sometimes... So you, another thing that's really useful is finding an organization. There, I don't know a good one for fine artists, but I, as I say, Graphic Artists Guild, ASMP, even if, you're not one of, even if you're not a photographer or a graphic designer, they can help you because it's all the same kind of principles, how to deal with contracts, what's going on in copyright. Um, there are a lot of cases now about what you can use of other people's work. I know tons of people have those questions, and it's all the same legal stuff. So um, they, they, before they were, when they were sending stuff out in hard co copy, they would, they would send out these newsletters, and there was a big drawing illustration of Condi Nasty, they would call it. And then they would talk about the, con the Condi Nast agreements and let you know like, what you can negotiate, what you can't, the levels of agreements. So it's useful for you to find an organization like that. Okay. So we, well, why, don't we, why don't you ask us the questions that you have? Well, there are you two. don't have, I mean, the thing is, you don't, the, the stuff that we're telling you isn't anything you have to do. You, could, you can let people do whatever you want with their work. But, Let's just say you did this for, um, even if somebody hired you to do a decoration for their wall, I mean, just it, realistically, they probably are going to want to own those rights and not to have you have control of that, you know, because you create it, you draw it, you make it, under the law, you, own, you have all these rights. They are not going to want you to have all these, I mean, maybe they won't care if you make wallpaper out of it for something else, or maybe they just want to have it, and you know, that's fine, you can let them have it. You don't have to do any of that. You have the rights. You know, it's like um, this law is in, it's been written. It's, in, it's a statute. It's a, it's a written law. So these rights exist. You don't have to enforce them. And, you know, if you're just, but it's just important to know about them. There, there are two ways to approach this, I think. One is a legal way, which is the, the last way that I like to do it. I mean, I know the law, but it's, it's often the worst way to approach these things. <laughs> um, because in a case like this, somebody's asking you to do something. Are you painting on the wall itself? Is that what you're doing? Are you making a painting for them? What are you doing? So the idea would be um, actually making a drawing digitally that I would then print and frame and give to them. They would get to the oh, well, that's uh, okay. I thought you were doing a mural of some kind. Yeah. All right, so this is something you're actually going to have on your computer that you could use for other purposes right. potentially. So in a case like that, then 
it would make sense to, to clarify the rights, you know, to have a, a writing that says, you know, I, I, you've engaged me to do this and I'm going to do this work for you and you're going to pay me this much money, but I, it, sh it needs, you know, we acknowledge that I retain all other rights other than your ability to show this on your wall. Something very simple that's not confrontational, it's not nasty, it's not scary, it's just really a restatement of what the law is. Because the non-law part of it is how you treat people, right? It, the fact that you have the law on your side doesn't mean you use it as a sledgehammer. This is a person who's paying you to do a service. And the fact that you own certain rights, you can simply specify it in the agreement. If you think that the person paying you is going to try to take those rights from you, um, then maybe you want to be silent about it. But I don't know. I mean, you'd have to consider it under, under all the circumstances and what you'd like to do. I like clarity. Clarity works. It's really good. If she's paying and she's just getting this thing for her wall and you say, you know, I'm going to have whatever rights there are in this thing. I can exhibit it. I can, it's my work. And she said, of course it's your work. You can do all these other things. Great. You have an agreement. Everybody's happy. You get paid. She may come to you when she has more money for more stuff. Right? You don't, want, you don't need to burn bridges and be mean to people. Just clear with people. And I think the important thing is that just to know she has this painting, but you have, you have all these rights. So if, if, if it's fine with everybody, you can do stuff with it. Just because she has it on her wall doesn't mean that you can't make, do other stuff with it. That's the, that's the good thing to know and how you handle it, as David said, it's right. completely up however you feel comfortable. But some, like somebody said to me, my painting's hanging in this gallery. Can I make prints of it? And as another thing, as David said, in copyright, the thing itself, you know, the painting that you make, let's say you, you, I'm the one that hires you to do it. I hang it on my wall. I own the thing, but I don't own any of the rights. The rights are yours. The rights are yours because you create it. That's another thing, like, as, yeah. as he said, that says owning the thing has nothing to do with the rights. Like I have, a, a, I'm reading a book, a, you know, I'm reading the Luminaries, I'm reading this book called The Luminaries, and I own this big fat thing. I own the book. I can give it to somebody, I can throw it away, I could tear it up. You can sell it to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, but the rights belong to the writer, so that, that's, that's the important thing to know. And maybe, like David said, you want to clarify that, but that, you, know, you that's don't have to. You can also, if you want to do something with it later, as a courtesy, you may say, um, you know, that, that thing I did on your wall, hey, come see it at the gallery or whatever. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You, you, it would depend on the circumstances. It would depend on how much money was involved. It would depend on it got this person's nose out of joint. Uh, if it, would, they, would they be upset? Is, I'm sorry, that's an old expression. <laughs> Um, w would they be unhappy if you exploited your work in some other way? And so who, that's sorry. up to you to determine, but you own the rights. So like the licensing of rights, if that's um, different than like what you said, the physical object, like it's right. thing that I might print and frame for them, they own that thing. Exactly. Right. They don't own the image. Even exactly. though they paid you to do it. Exactly. That's yes. correct. Yeah. I mean, you, if, that, if you remember nothing else, that's so important because you're going to get paid to do work. Hopefully, you want to get paid to do work. It never means that they own the rights unless they're your employee, employer. That's just written in the law. Employer owns the rights. So how many of you work for a company, at advertising agencies or, oh, okay. So whatever you do there. A PR firm, you know. They own anything. the rights, but that's, otherwise, they don't. You don't even have to. You don't to. have to have a contract. You can even talk to them. You can do it. You can send an email. You know, an e two emails can make a contract, really. I think that there are various. I think you pick. Yeah. <laughs> you you can de you can decide. It's like if you have um, what's the um, open office. You know, they've decided that their open office. I don't know if anybody knows it. It re it replaces Microsoft Office. Um, replaces, doesn't replace. It's a different kind of word processing, ex Excel spreadsheet, it's all that stuff. But it's, it's all 
open and available to people for free. And it's under a particular kind of a license that allows anybody who wants to make changes to it, go forth, make all the changes you want, but, but it's going to be owned as part of this open office thing. So you can determine how you want your art. You don't have to have copyright on your work. You can, you can do whatever you want with it. It's yours to do what you want with. Well, I well, mean, that the thing with creative, you can decide question. <laughs> what you want to do with your work. You can, you know, you, you don't give up your copyright but, unless you want to, but you can decide and go to Creative Commons and say, I'm willing to, to let people use my work in this way. If they're using it non-commercially, you can use it for nothing, and you can do that. You can it's also just, just it, not enforce your rights. You know, people, you put your images on Facebook. I mean, that is, if you think about it, you know, if, you, if you ever read the terms of service, like most people don't, I don't. But a while ago, it used to say that they, you know, they have to have the right to display, to reproduce, to duplicate, and what else? Well, that's it. Your work. So if you put your photograph up there, you're, you know, you're giving them the rights to do that. But they can't do what they do without those rights. So in their term of service, it says you give us the right to, to duplicate, to reproduce, to display your work. I don't think it says adapt, and for a while it says sell. Well, that would be crazy, and Instagram said that for a while. People had a furor, because that means they could take your image and they could sell it for, you know, commercially. That's not what that's supposed to be about. So that, you know, that got changed. But you can do, no, but nobody's saying you have to enforce it. You can, you know, just, you can give your painting to somebody and you can give them rights if you want. No. No, 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 nothing, not if, a, not. If it was painted no. on the wall, that raises interesting Don't questions even. about PS1 and things that are going on in Queens, and there's painting on a wall, and is, and also Picasso tapestry in the Four Seasons restaurant. Uh, there's all kinds of, it gets weird, it gets, most things are not on the edge between, um, you know, fair use, which we, that's the first time we've even used the phrase, and I won't use it again. There, there are circumstances under which you can use things without having the rights. Yeah, you yeah. are allowed to. It's built into the copyright law. But we're talking black and white here Just because be, we yeah. have to. Yeah. We I mean, we to. could do a whole thing oh. on fair use. I mean, somebody called me from Parsons and NIFA and said, my students are doing 3D sculptures. Is that, is that the right term? And they don't know, they like, what, can, what they can, what can they use this, but can they, they use that? Uh, it's a big subject. That's a whole other big subject, which we could go into another time or you want to you learn about, like, when you can use copyrighted work. I mean, how many of you ap appropriate use other people's work? Yeah. And there are lots of times when it's fine and times when it's not fine, and there's a whole bunch of law about that, and there are, law, there are laws about uh, work being damaged and, and, and changed. There are lots of different laws that apply to your work that we could never get to touch on in one hour. The, the, ideal, the ideal situation from a legal perspective is to have a provision in a contract or several paragraphs that expressly states who has what rights to do what and for how long those rights last and what territories they're in and all that. We're in an imperfect world. If, you, if, you, if there's enough money on the line and it's important enough to you under the circumstances, you find a lawyer who understands the stuff and you have him or her write it and make sure that it says what you need it to say. And it can even be negotiated with the person on the other side if it, if it gets to that. What are you being, may I ask, what are you being paid for, for this work, for the wall? Yes. Very nice. Congratu no, congratulations. That's great. I, had a, uh, I did a deal for uh, somebody who builds uh, Broadway sets. It's a client of mine. And they did a deal with Walt Disney Company. And they were paid over $100,000. And the, p the lawyer at Walt Disney would not listen to me. Didn't care what I had to say. They made one minor change that didn't make any difference. My client was over the moon about it, delighted. Doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter to you, it doesn't matter. He couldn't own rights in a set anyway. 
He didn't care. He was getting paid a lot of money, and if he did well for Walt Disney, they'd hire him again. That's what he knew. Okay? So you've got to determine, based on all the facts you have, uh, 250 bucks. I think it's not worth saying anything. It's a nice payday, but you're not going to hire a lawyer to, to deal with that. Great question. I, I get it all the time. I get it all the time. You just do. And you know, you can ask them if you want to, but I think you use it in your portfolio. Yeah, and you can ask them if you want to, but you got, you, a, I mean. That's a dangerous game. I've, I've, ha I've seen the letters. I've gotten letters from people. I had a client sued over exactly that. So it, it, it may be okay. It may be okay. The problem is the, if, if, you're, if you're getting a lot of traffic to your website, every portfolio seems to be website now. Are you, is that what you have in mind, yeah. digital? Um, the more traffic that goes to it, the more eyes on it, the more likely you are to get caught. Now, if you're doing commercial work for somebody, they bought it, they own it, it's work for hire, say, what right do you have to show it? You don't, technically. You don't have a right. So what I try to get uh, in commercial deals, I, I, first I ask the, the, my client if they care, and they may not, but if they, if they really want this and it's part of their plan to have this work on their website, I ask for the limited right to use it on the website. I'm very specific about it. I talk to the lawyer on the other side. I say, this is an artist. All she wants to do is have it on the website. 99 times out of 100, I hear fine. It's when, they, it's when you don't ask and they catch you that hell happens, in my experience. Now, you may not have had that experience, and that's great. I haven't had it a lot. Most people don't care. But you want to have the rights. You want the rights. You want to be the good guy. You know, you, you, it's just always better to be on the right side of these things. So in agreements that you have, you can ask the question. You can say, I want to retain the, the express right. I want to write into the agreement that I can use this in my portfolio, in all media. That's all you have to say. Now known or after divide. Well, you can I'm get. Kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but that's. That would be, that would, I think that, no, I'm just kidding. Well, you don't have to do such, uh, you know. Uh, okay. If you make your best efforts, you protect yourself, and you can, and you can go forth and make money confidently, right? Because it's an ad for you. Right? It's commercial use. Royalties are when you get paid for something, sell, when you get paid for uses of your work. Royalties are money. So let's say the, um, the guys who did the book, not the Met, they get, they get paid every time a book is sold. They get a certain percentage of all the receipts that come in, that the publisher gets the money for the book. They, let's say the publisher gets $10,000 this month. They get 5% of that in royalties. It's, it's payments. It's a portion of the payments that goes to the, to the artist. Royalties means money. What, money. what often happens if you, if in the book world in particular, you'll get an advance against royalties. That'll be your initial payment. They'll pay you 10 grand or whatever, whatever it is, however much money. But it's not a fee. They're not just giving you $10,000. This is money that they're going to take out of royalties that will be payable to you later. So for example, if a book is a dollar and the royalties are 5% of every book sold, for every dollar that comes in, you get a nickel. That's, that's it in its simplest form. If you've gotten uh, an advance against royalty, Think of it as a, as a hole in the ground. And they're throwing nickels into the ground. It's a $10,000 hole. As, as soon as the nickels reach uh, the level of the ground again, then all those ad nickels after that 10,000, then they get paid to you. So they pay them back the 10 as the advance from the nickels, and then all the rest of the nickels go to you. So I mean, royal, just you know the concept Makes of sense. royalties is, <laughs> is Money that you get on every item sold or performed, you can get royalties when things are, are performed. It's, it's 
a portion of the money, royalties means money, a portion of money that gets paid to you. That happens in an agreement, usually. Most, like, like in their agreement, they decided that they would get 5% of the, of the royalty. The agreement says so. So it doesn't happen automatically. It's something that you agree to because you've licensed your right to somebody. You know, so. Or even assign them. Whatever it is, it you can. The words. Right, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but yeah, you yeah. can retain the right to a royalty. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they say people who make dolls or they design things and a com like somebody does, let's say somebody designs a doll that gets made by a manufacturer. The manufacturer sells them, the next Barbie or whatever doll people like these days. The, the manufacturer, say so Mattel gets the money, but if you design that doll, your agreement with Mattel could say, I get 10 cents, 10, fat, 10 dollars, whatever, for every doll that's sold. So the, the proceeds come into the company, and then they pay you a percentage of that. That's, that's, royalty means money. You can take that one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Depends. Well, what's the question? Um, you're, you're kind of a lucky man, I suppose. You, you keep the money, but your book hasn't sold. So I don't know. <laughs> What's your question exactly? Oh, so Are you, you responsible? I'm sorry. Car carry on. What is it? Right. No, typically. It, typically, no. Again, that depends on the con. I mean, it probably, right. it could say, you would try to have them say a non refundable advance because you're going to say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to spend this year writing, my, writing this book and I, how do I know that you're going to yeah. promote it and stuff? It depends on what the contract says. Historically, the, 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 the way that they've structured these in the music business as well, say a band goes in back when they had bands that actually got you know, record contracts, um, they give you $100,000 as a recording fund to go in and make your record. They, they release the record, nothing happens. Um, you're not in a position to pay them back the 100000 and it isn't reasonable for them to expect that. The agreement could say that you owe them that money, but I've, I can't say as I've ever seen that. And it's unlikely it would be enforceable anyway. You'd, it's like getting blood from a stone. Suing a rock band, they have no money. What are they going to do? Sell their, sell their guitar? Like, they, they're not going to pay that back. But you know, I've seen, I have a client who was a young guy who was picked up by Marlboro Gallery from Pierogi, and Marlboro liked his work so much they gave him money they gave him they call it an advance in the art world too and they gave him money to live on every month and he got really upset that they weren't selling his work and he wanted out but of course they said you got to pay this money back so he had to make he had to deal with them um, you had to deal with them to work out enough to give them work so that at least he could get out of that gallery and, and move on so it, it can change from it's by you know, contract. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's by contract. That's it. The bottom line. You do. I mean, there was just, if you just read in the paper about this, uh, Daniel Morell, who the photographer who took the photographs in Haiti, and they were all over, you know, sent around the world through Twitter, and uh, all the agencies picked him up and used him and didn't pay him and didn't credit him, and he just got a million dollars. Because he, he sued, he got a lawyer. But the it, it's a terrible, stupid rule. But in order to get high amounts of money, when you sue somebody for violating your copyright, these wonderful rights we're telling you you have, you have to have registered. Before it's infringed means used, taken, or within three months. But how do you know? So I would, I would do it as much as you possibly can. And ASMP has a big tutorial on it. It's not hard to do. There are a few legal terms that you need to know, which are pretty much in the instructions and if you don't know, you know, it'd be great to have a, a, a session on doing it, but you can find it mm. online and it, it, you can do groups of photographs. It's, it's really important. It's, that applies to everybody, actually. You're, you're, in order to get money, if you sue somebody, there was a guy that did eyewear for The Gap. It, it, um, I forgot his name. Om Davis. Did, so he lives on East 7th Street. I live like a block from me. And he created this 
ornamental eyewear that was considered artwork, and it, they were, it was using Gap ads, and he said, wrote to the Gap and said, you used my work without my consent, you know, copyright infringement. Gap said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? He sued them. He won. Copyright infringement. And then the court says, well, what are your damages? Because they always wanted, you have to prove what you lost. He makes no money. He makes 700 bucks a year from his glasses. That's what he got. If he'd registered his copyright, the law says the court can award $150,000 per infringement. Big money. And can pay your legal fees. So if you're going to do something big time, you want to do it. It's a pain in the neck. Yes, definitely you definitely register. And that, people say, like, in my generation, they used to say, like, if you, you can mail, you mail your, your work to, to yourself, yourself and, and that's don't, proof, don't open it. doesn't mean a thing. No. And so it's, you go on that website I gave you, and it tells you how to do it. You can do it online. You can do it on a piece of paper. You don't need a lawyer for it, but you got it. There are two or three words you want to know, like, you know, but it's really important. Yes, it's it's thirty five dollars to register. Thing is, you just you figure out there are lots and lots of rules on there, are lots of regulations and this and that, but um, these organizations can help you because you probably have lots of images. Thirty five dollars an image, which like nobody's ever going to do. You can do groups, you can do, uh, you know, I don't. You could call it artwork two thousand thirteen or artwork December two thousand thirteen. Be as specific as you can. But I would start to do it, get in the habit of doing it. One of those pain in the neck things that'll, it's the best insurance that you can have for yourself. A another good thing to do is to use copyright notices where, where appropriate. I mean, you don't have to be weird about it, but if you're publishing something, a little C in a circle with the year that it was published, followed by the name, either your name or your company name or some name where somebody can track you. There's no specific rule about what the name has to be. And you can put all rights reserved because that gives you international protection. It's a good habit. Well, what you're, what you're registering is the website. So it should be the last time you made a change to the website. Oh, okay. Right? That's not the specific work. If you are concerned about the specific work, and there are ways of protecting yourself, such as using low-res images, right? Um, you, you might have a, a copyright symbol, you know, the notice right below it or on the side of it or, you know, figure out what looks good to you. But that's a, that's a good idea. You know, idea. it's a good question. Like notice. say, I put, I put copyright notice on this PowerPoint. I change, when I change the, pa the PowerPoint, I change the year, but it really be, makes more sense to have the earliest year because if I say 2014, and somebody copied it last year, it's not going to kill my It wouldn't my matter case, anyway because you hadn't registered at the yeah, time, so true. you're not going to be true. able to sue for <laughs> legal fees and That's statutory true. damages. That's true. Right. It's, it's a really good idea. And I would do, yeah. you're going to do groups. But if there's, if there's like a big project that you have that's a, I, I, may, I may do that by itself because it's hard, you know, if you think of somebody doing a search, there's, it's not an image directory, so if somebody wants to know if they, they, they want to license your work, then how are they going to find it? You, you know, they're only, they can only find it by looking, uh, yeah. it's a um, whole just, thing. Just so uh, we understand about copyright, it exists in, when it's an expression in a fixed form. So when you put paint on a canvas or you snap an image and it's digitally available or it's on film, those are fixed forms and the copyright already exists. Registration means you're registering what already exists. Right. Just so you understand right. the shape of right. these things. You have all these rights as soon as you create it. The registration is just a means to enforce it. So even if you don't, I mean I've written letters, I'm sure you have too, that just say if, if you you, you know, we're going to sue you, and then you know you really can't sue somebody because they haven't registered. But you have copyright whether you register or not. That's, That's right. Yeah, it depends I, I on think, how you... I suppose it may even not depend. I don't know what the rules are with Creative Commons. I have to say my clients want to own what they own. Um, 
because that just, I don't, haven't had anybody who wanted to come to me about Creative Commons. You so, just have to look at that, li look at the license. Yeah. You gave them a license. You gave, you gave, you took your copyright, as he described it, and you gave them the right to do something with it and other people the right. Mm -hmm. Maybe it must be for a, a uh, there must be a way to terminate it, to end it, I would think. Or maybe it's just for a year. Look and see what the term is. It's it depends on what it says. Look it it, it up. depends on the contract. <laughs>